Well, hello folks. This is my first voiceover. Let's see how this goes. I've never done one of these before, so so far so good anyway. So, um, yeah, cracked but not broken. Uh, this is a piece of cherry, and, um, you know, if you've been, if you subscribe to my account or you've been watching my videos, you know that, um, that I repair a lot of these bowls. Um, so yeah, I always true up the outside of the bowl first. I'm using a 5 8 bowl uh, by David Ellsworth. Um, nice heavy duty bowl gouge. And then I always flatten the rim as well and then move to the inside. And you know, I just try and um, don't try and be too aggressive. I do like to use waste blocks on the bottom of my bowls and homemade uh, face plates. I'll actually try and um, cover those a little bit, maybe on the next video. But yeah, just keep uh, whittling away till you get down and get everything nice and trued up. I do leave my bowls relatively thick. Um, I like a functional bowl that's got a bit of weight to it. And I also need the thickness in the rim to do the inlays that I do. So that's kind of why they're the thickness that they are. I know some people have commented on that. Uh, one thing I will say that, you know, if you drop a, a wooden bowl and it's fairly thick like the bowls I make, there's a good chance it's going to survive. But if it's uh, a thinner bowl, well, it's probably going to crack. So that's another reason. I, I, you know, I consider my pieces to be functional art. So um, I want people to use them. But, you know, it's beautiful enough to sit on your table when it's not being used. So of course, um, this bowl, I didn't actually didn't see the crack on the other side when I first mounted this piece, or when I first looked at it. And um, yeah, I could just take a straight cut in and cut that out of there. But you know, I like to give the uh, I like to give the the cut a little bit of flair, a little bit of style, if you will. So you know, it's not it's not you'll very rarely ever see me just come in straight. And that's on the other side as well. And you know, there's a number of ways you can cut these out of here. You could use a coping saw. In the past, I've used a sawzall. Uh, this time, I decided to use a jigsaw, and it actually worked pretty good. It's got a new blade on it, real coarse blade. So that seemed to work quite efficiently. So yeah, just keep going and remove the bulk of the material. And whatever tool you have at hand to knock the other piece out. Yeah, this is a Typhoon Carving Burr. Uh, the link is in the description for them. Uh, that one I bought at Lee Valley here in Canada. And it's a really good tool for this for this um, this, this application. Uh, and this one's actually probably a couple of years old and it still cuts well. So, uh, but it is starting to, to uh, dull out a bit, so I might find one here soon. And they have a whole um, line of different burrs that you can buy. Fine and coarse. So yeah, just uh, keep going at it till you um, get it nice and smooth. Of course, we're going to inlay cherry branches in this. Uh, this is typically how I cut them. You could cut them on a chop saw too, but uh, I find that uh, cutting them on the bandsaw is, is actually safer, so that's why I like to do them there. And again, you could put in really small ones, large ones, a mix of both. It's, you know, it's up to you. Of course, Starbond Thin. There's a link in the description for that as well to get 10% off. At checkout on your next order, just click on the link that's provided in the description. So yeah, we'll set set them, and then of course we use the accelerator to keep them in place. Do the other side as well. Yeah, so here we're uh, grinding back the, the branches. Uh, I like to leave them just proud of the surface. And I mean just barely. 
Um, and anyway, that's just so that we can get tape on the back side of the bowl uh, to retain the inlay material and the thin CA glue. I should also mention that uh, when, you, uh, when you're at checkout with Starbond, use uh, code INLAYGYM. And of course, you want to rough up the copper wire. This is something that I haven't done in previous videos, uh, but I'm going to do it this time. So yeah, I thought I'd put some of these uh, twisted copper wire in there. And it's important that they're actually twisted, not straight. If they're just simply straight, um, they can fall out of the inlay. They can maybe work free over time. So these, these of course, are the twisted ones. So, you know, once the, uh, once the inlay material and the CA glue goes around those, they're not coming out. Just cut, cut off a bunch of them and put them where you want them. You know, it's up to you. Um, it's whatever you want, it's whatever you like, whatever you think looks good. And again, it's important to always use the thin CA glue. So before I put the tape on, I want to grind the, um, the copper wire back so it's flush with the surface of the wood. That way it's not poking through the tape. And then we have CA glue running everywhere. And I like to use just simple old duct tape. The cheaper, the better. It is important that it gets on there well. Um, Adhesion is certainly your friend here. The last thing you want is that CA glue running out. Yeah, so uh, I'm just going to show you how I actually make my inlay material. Again, I get lots of questions about this as well. So fine strainer, that plastic conduit just keeps stuff from flying all over the place. I just kind of smash it up small enough that it uh, will fit in there. Once I got a good amount of it, I'll take it over and run it through the strainer. I'm only looking for the fine material. I don't want the big heavy coarse material. I find um, if you mix the two of them together, the inlay kind of looks um, speckled, which is fine if that's what you're going for, but uh, usually I'm not. So that's why I do it this way. So I just keep going until I fill up my container and that's it. Okay, so when I initially start doing the, um, putting in the inlay material, I always start at the top. And I try to make the very rim of the bowl uh, act like a dam. That way, when the when the rest of the material goes in, uh, it won't run out through the dam that I've made at the very top or on the rim of the bowl. So that's usually where I always start whenever I have any of these inlays that go from the rim down inside the bowl. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, just try and get the material in there any way you can. It's not easy, not an easy thing to film because you know you're trying to knock material down in there, but you get the idea. Um, try not to overfill the inlay at the beginning, uh, preferably about half half the way through, and then put the thin CA glue in. Just let it kind of wick in for a little bit, and then fill in around the branches. Uh, if you tried to actually take this over to the lathe and turn those branches prior to putting the inlay material in, you're going to find that it's just going to break a lot of the branches off. So anyway, uh, once you get it in from the inside, flip it over, take the tape off, and then make sure it's filled all the way through on the back side. Fancy installation tool there, screwdriver handle. <laughs> Yeah, 
And yeah, you'll find usually find some dry spots on the back side. And I'm not con too concerned about the CA glue getting on the end grain here because this is going to be turned away. This will probably lose about uh, an eighth of an inch or three sixteenth of an inch, maybe even more than that in thickness. Uh, so I'll turn, I'll, we'll put this back on the lathe. But I like to let it sit overnight. And that way it's good and um, the adhesive is good and set. So again, just using a 5 8 bowl gouge. And yes, the, um, the inlay material will certainly take the edge off your tool. Uh, it is harder than wood. So yes, you'll have to sharpen more. Uh, I like the shear scrape. As you can see, I've, I've dropped the handle on the gouge. So, you know, I, shear scraping on the outside of the bowl is certainly uh, the best way that I've, that I've seen so far to cut these inlays back. Or tool these inlays back, I should say. So there, I'm pretty happy with that. It's cut pretty clean. You can see the voids in it, so we'll have to fill it again. Same thing on the inside. So yeah, just uh, nice easy cuts here. You don't really, uh, you don't want to be too aggressive with this. You don't want to risk breaking one of the branches off. Or tearing it out. Just nice light, light cuts. And I didn't show it, but actually when I, cutting back this inlay, I actually sharpened the gouge twice. Again, stop in to check your progress. Yeah, so this is a new tool for me. Uh, it's the uh, carbide finisher from Easy Wood Tools. Uh, believe it or not, I've never. This is the first carbide tool that I own. I've never used one before, and it actually did a really good job of uh, eliminating a lot of tear out on the inside of the bowl. What typically will happen with these inlays is because the inlay is harder than the surrounding wood the bowl gouge will kind of bounce off the inlay and then dig in on the other side. So anyway, with the carbide tool, they cut it clean. So I'm actually very happy and pleased with it. So this is the second filling. Same idea, just fill in any of the voids. Again, using the thin CA glue and accelerator. I am trying to pay a little attention to the fact that, you know, I don't really want a huge amount of CA glue going on the, uh, the end grain right now. So again, back on the lathe, trimming things again. Inlays like this uh, can take uh, three or four fillings. Usually when it's getting down to the very end, I just go out and sand out the bowl to uh, 320 and then fill any... Um, 
imperfections in and then that it, that's it, it'll be done. Again, very light cuts. As always, I'm sanding from 60 to 320 grit. And those are the three and a half inch dimple discs from um, sandpaper.ca. There's actually a link in the description for them as well. And I like to go forward and reverse with the lathe and then reverse, go forward with the drill and reverse with the drill accordingly. And as you can see, I mean, it kicks up a pile of dust. Uh, I use a self-powered respirator. It's uh, very important to protect your lungs here. And as always, wood bowl finished by General Finishes. And there's a link in the description for that as well. Now, if this is early in the day, uh, you can actually put on the second coat later on in the day. Uh, usually, I put the first coat on really heavy and I let it sit overnight before I put on the second coat. So, usually, it sits overnight. Little copper bling sticking out there. Four O steel wool. I've used I've used those Scotch Bright pads. Um, I keep going back to the four O steel wool. It just I don't know. I just it gives me a better surface um, to put the second and third coat on. And for some people, after the second coat, that might be good enough uh, for you. Um, I like a shiny bowl, I like a bowl that's really well protected. So that's why the vast majority of my stuff will always see three coats of finish. Uh, the only time that it doesn't is if it's a really hard material, like maple burl uh, or rock maple, hard maple. Then sometimes it'll only take two coats. The harder the wood, the nicer the shine. Sure looks pretty. So yeah, I'll be honest with you, this is the only time that I actually really get nervous when I using this method that I do. Uh, but I, you know, I really like the fact that I can do the inside and the outside of the bowl completely and then just finish the, the foot separately. Uh, you know, the, the uh, hot melt glue stays on there well. Um, you know, every now and then I'll lose one. I probably could make some sort of a pillow catch system and set it on the, the bed of the lathe, but anyway, I haven't done it yet. <laughs> and there is a little crack on the bottom of the bowl. Uh, I had debated on inlaying that as well, but after I get done um, flattening the bottom, I looked at it, you know, it, it's just a small, fine cracked and it's not you know and it's full full of CA glue so I was like you know it's fine I'm just gonna leave the way it is and again I'm using a vacuum chuck uh, if you do any amount of bowls I highly recommend getting a vacuum chuck once that's held on there with 23 inches of vacuum it will take a lot to pull it off and you don't mark up your bowl in any way when you're using it Again, I usually uh, when I'm when I'm sanding because it's all because it's all face grain. I usually start sanding at 180 and finish at 320. That's just on the bottom of the bowl now. So there, I got all the info on the bottom of the bowl. And again, I always put the type of wood and whatever the inlay material is. 
uh, and they are numbered and of course uh, my signature in Canada. And the bottom will typically only need a couple of coats. It won't need three coats because it's face green. There's no end green typically. So that's why you uh, you might only need two coats. Well, it usually is. You, I usually only put two on it. Anyway, um, that's it. Let's do a fridge kiln update. Okay, so this is your fridge kiln update and actually your last one because everything is dry. Uh, we started, I believe, with 22 bowls, and that's what we have dry. I've actually finished one already. Um, yeah, everything's down to 7%. There's one bowl that isn't. It's at 8%, but we'll call that done, because that way I can reload it. And uh, last video, I said I had some insect holes emerge. So that's one of the main reasons to kiln dry, is to, is to push these bugs out of the wood or kill them. Uh, the other thing too is some of these are from my meter, the pins on my meter, but I know that there's some bug holes there because this was completely covered in the end grain sealer, the anchor seal, so it would have filled in any of those holes if they were there before. And um, three of the walnut bowls cracked. This is the worst. Now, that crack doesn't go all the way through. So I still might be able to salvage this bowl, turn away all these cracks, and you'll never know that, that they were there. And if not, um, I'll do an inlay. No big deal. So yeah, uh, I just want to, the last little bit I want to do in front of the fridge, I'll show you what I got written on there. And then uh, we'll talk about the bowl and get this video done. Okay, so this is the last little thing that I want to do with the fridge kiln. Uh, and it's just a review of, of how things went over the month and, well, over the five weeks. So on the 9th of September, bowls went in at 25 degrees Celsius and they're at 20%. On the 13th, I figured that wasn't enough. I put it up to 30 degrees Celsius and they were already sitting at 18%. So if I had to do this over again, I would have started them at 30%. Once bowls are, you know, below 20%, it's probably safe to start them, start them at that temperature for sure. Uh, on the 18th, still at 30%. Uh, the bowls by then had already dropped to 14 to 18%. Just depends on the wood. Uh, the cherry dried a lot faster than the walnut did. So, you know, most of the walnut bowls were sitting at 18% while the cherry was sitting at 14. Uh, 21st, I put it up to uh, 40 degrees Celsius. And by then, things were at 14 to 16% instead of 14 to 18%. Uh, and so everything, everything I, was, I was pleased to hear. We started to get some cracking, which is, you know, I, I've had a really hard time drying walnut. And, you know, it just goes to show in my old kiln, it was the same deal. So uh, I'm not exactly sure what the answer is to that. Anyway, so from the 21st to the 5th of October, they sat in there. Uh, and by then, at 40 degrees, and they, you know, they were down to 9 to 14%. Again, just depends on the wood. Um, and I removed six bowls at that on the 5th of October. Those were the cherry bowls, and I think there was a couple of thinner uh, walnut bowls that were done as well. 19th, um, so anyway, we put it up to 50 degrees, which is 120 Fahrenheit. And um, on the 9th of October, I took four uh, walnut bowls out that were actually dry down to 7%. And then five days later, everything was done. Once you get 50 degrees, once you hit the 50 degree mark, it doesn't take long to, to drive the moisture out of the bowls before they're done. A um, couple of things that are really different from this other uh, freezer kiln that I have. Of course, um, probably the biggest thing is at no time was there any moisture inside this fridge. You could rub, you could rub your hands anywhere inside this fridge kiln and you'd never, uh, you wouldn't feel any moisture. So the bathroom exhaust fan did a real good job of extracting that moisture out of there. Um, if, you, if you buy the exact same model that's in the fridge kiln build video, uh, what I recommend doing is putting silicone on one side of the dampener in the back of it and on the other so that when it opens and closes, it has something to rest up against and seal up against. Once I did that, um, it didn't take long for the fridge to, to build up uh, temperature. 
Without that, there was a lot of heat escaping out the top of the fridge, fridge kiln. And the only other thing that I'll be doing is adding a second light um, base in here, and that's going to be directly plugged into the heating side of the controller. So those three things are, or should say, well, really, the biggest dramatic thing between this and that is the amount of moisture that's not in the in the uh, the kiln. So anyway, that's it. Hopefully you've enjoyed all this. Um, every now and then I may pop in and give you an update on what's going on with it. But other than that, that's it. So um, anyway, curious to hear your comments about that. So anyway, let's uh, finish this video up because it is about the bowl and not this. Well, that's it for the video. Um, I know there was a lot of comments last week about me not speaking on the video, so I thought maybe doing a voiceover video might, might be better. I'm just trying to cut back the length of my videos. That's the whole idea. Uh, and again, if you've been here from the start with my channel, uh, a lot of this stuff is very repetitive, so I figured that I might be able to cut a lot of that out and it wouldn't affect anything. But uh, I guess you guys want to hear me speak, so <laughs> hopefully this is uh, a happy medium between the two. Um, so anyway, let's talk about the bowl. Again, cherry, cherry branches, soapstone, and twisted copper wire. And again, this go just goes to show what you can do to a bowl that is cracked really badly. And, you know, I don't think anybody's first impression when they pick these bowls up and look at it and go, oh, that must have been where a crack was. Most people look this at this and go, wow, that's really cool. So, you know, it's all in the deception, if you will. Um, but anyway, people love these bowls, so as long as they love them, I'm gonna keep making them. Um, so again, here's the bottom. Three coats of wood bowl finish by General Finishes, 4-0 steel wall between them. Uh, all the links are in the description below for the products that are used in the video. Uh, what else? So yeah, yeah, let me know what you think about the voiceover this week. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, it was something new for me to figure out. So, And um, again, thanks for tuning in on the fridge kiln build and all the other videos associated with it. I really appreciate it. So anyway, if you leave me a comment, let me know what you think. And of course, anytime you give my videos a thumbs up, that certainly helps with the analytics. And um, subscribe. Don't forget to subscribe. Uh, I'm also going to be doing a 15,000 subscriber giveaway uh, next week's bowl. That's what that's going to be. So make sure you come back for that. And I'll tell you what you need to do to win this really nice bowl. So anyway, until next week, take care, stay safe, and don't forget the bell.